name. I have 10, 29, and 40 seconds. So that clock is wrong. So you can keep talking. No, I'm just joking, you can't. So, um, nine seconds now. See, it's almost 10.30. I knew everybody would quiet down. So good morning. Right. Hope your day has gone well so far. Thank you for coming to the second half of the session. Um, so, I thought I'd, uh, today, who has their program? I just want to read. Who's going to hand me the program? Here we go. So you guys are in the second concurrent session, right, called the future of the department. <laughs> there we go. That's pretty broad, huh? All right. Um, and this is the second time I've done it. So um, it'll probably be different than the first time. That's OK, right? So uh, I have, so this is, you know, uh, uh, when we talked about this uh, early, you know, I'm a, I'm a procrastinator, okay? I did this last night. But I think it turned out okay. Right. We'll, I'll let you guys judge. But this is really about interaction. Um, and that doesn't look right right now. So let me just go back here for a second. There, that's better. So you can see it. So, um, the, the thing I'm most nervous about, by the way, is the stand. I was very, I kept looking back at it this morning while we were there. I don't even want to touch it because I feel like it's all going to, like the whole thing's going to come over. Um, but it held up, so that's the good news. So today, or this morning, for the next 60 minutes, we get to have interaction. What does that mean? It means we get to have dialogue. It means you get to ask questions or disagree, right? Have conversation. And so um, this is, uh, you know, pretty opinion-based, right? It's uh, talking about future. And, uh, and one of the things I think is always very important, it's why I uh, uh, like this day, um, uh, is, is we all get caught up in day-to-day right, -day activities. Uh, we all do. It's one of those things that we're constantly trying to do our day-to-day -day work. And it's hard a lot of times to see the horizon much less really look at what that horizon looks like. You know, where are we going? You know, what's happening uh, overall? And for all of us that's gone through leadership uh, training, right, it's that quadrant two, spending time in that quadrant two perspective. A lot of times, just as, as, as I know it's true for you, uh, the best time for me is actually when I'm traveling, <laughs> is uh, when I'm on a plane <laughs> or, uh, you know, when Troy was driving me down to Council Bluffs yesterday. Um, you know, gives me time to uh, sort of step away from issues and think about, uh, you know, what is happening uh, in transportation today? Are there things that we should be doing? Are there things we are doing? You know, uh, are, what, how does that, what is the net effect on us as an organization, okay? And so today, I don't have a lot of stuff. It's more of a conversation, and so we'll see where this goes. We have a microphone right here. Doesn't mean you have to come down here. I can run it up there if somebody needs to um, um, ask a question, or I can repeat it too, um, or a comment. And so, what I title it is the Transportation Event Horizon. I love that. I, I, I thought that was pretty good. Okay, uh, Event Horizon. Does anybody know that? It's actually a movie, right? As uh, Charlie told me, it's a really bad movie. So, but it's still, it's the concept. So an event horizon is actually an uh, astronomical term. Um, it actually has to do with a black hole. So it's the rim of where light and radiation cease to exist in a black hole. So it's theoretical. But it's also, essentially, you know, when you think about that, a point of no return, right? Where light doesn't exist, a point of no return. So I liked it in the sense of transportation event horizon. Have there been event horizons in the history of transportation? Absolutely, right? Very clearly. They're, you can see them now. They're points of no return, right? When Ford, Henry Ford, started really making a vehicle for every single person, that was a point of no return, right? Significant shift in what transportation was and what mobility was uh, in connecting people. Right? So, um, and I believe we are 
uh, in the midst. And I actually believe in all of our lifetimes, we are going to be part of a point of no return in transportation. We're on the cusp of it uh, right now. And so what I want to do is talk about what I think that is, in some sense, what some of the national beliefs of what that is, and then sort of talk a little bit about what, that, what we all think that means for us as an organization, um, and whether we think it means anything uh, in that sense also. So, OK, good, yes? Yes, I want to hear yes. yes. Thank you, all right. That's the interaction part, right? OK, so what is the event horizon in transportation? OK, so one of the, I had the opportunity so this is the other story that I'll tell real fast. And uh, um, so because of, I like to say, because of all of you, the great work that you guys have done, because of, I think, how Iowa is standing out amongst all DOTs, is I, I've had the opportunity to become Asheville president. And, uh, and um, there's two meetings. So I got this call about six months ago. There's two meetings uh, that typically they want. Uh, there's actually more, but there's two for sure they want me to go to. One is ITS World Congress, which is one of the large uh, national, international meetings. It rotates by continent. Um, each year it's seven to 10,000 people, countries all over, Intelligent Transportation Systems, uh, World Congress. Uh, it's a huge meeting. Um, last year, hey, hey, no, I'm still here. Last year, it was in Detroit. This year, it was in Bordeaux, France. So, yeah, I had to go. Lori made me. It was awful, by the way. It was a terrible meeting. And uh, the second meeting is uh, one that happens every four years, and it happens in the fall in the four years that I'm president. And it's this world, International World Road Congress meeting. And uh, the last one four years ago I heard was in Mexico City. I don't know a lot about uh, Mexico City, but this one is in Seoul, South Korea. And it's in, I leave a week, just over a week from today. And I'm part of the USDOT's delegation that goes. So, and it gives you exposure to what is a lot of the discussion sort of going on uh, internationally. And this first thing, mobility as a service, is the discussion. Okay? There's strong belief that that is the future of uh, transportation, mobility as a service. So, what is mobility as a service? We're going to talk about that a little bit and try to describe that so you can get a better sense of what that means. And uh, driverless vehicles, right? Constant topic. Connected vehicles, fully automated vehicles, driverless vehicles. There's a lot of conversation around that. Seamless modal mobility, as I like to say, right? The connectivity piece from one mode to another, seamless, I think is on the event horizon. Data, right? Choices us being able to choose what we think is best for us right? in, in a lot of different ways. And then and a lot of that choice comes from these types of devices. We're going to get into that. Shared, right? So when you think of mobility as a service, and I have a slide that's going to describe it here in a second, there's a lot of belief that with driverless vehicle, fully automation, right, is that there's going to be more sharing, right, of rides, that, um, hey, I'm going to call up my vehicle, or I'm going to call up a, a vehicle on my phone, right? Who uses Uber? Anybody use Uber? Ooh, bigger group than the last time, right? Uber's pretty awesome, right? And it actually, I've learned that it's here uh, in uh, Ames. So I could bring up Uber, and I looked uh, before in the last class, and it was three minutes. I could get a car outside and take me pretty much anywhere where I want to go. That's pretty phenomenal. Uh, as a company, considering they don't own anything, okay, except this, this technology, right? That's pretty, uh, very transformative when you think of it from a mobility perspective. Um, so it says four minutes this time. So there was a car sitting there before. I've used it in other cities. It's been phenomenal. And, but so, but what they talk about is shared rides. So a lot of the discussion is that, so what do you think our person per vehicle number is in the state? Two? Does anybody say two? Yeah, it's, it's right around 1.1, 1.2. Typically, that's what it is. So a lot of the belief, right, is that there will be more sharing in the future. That, that you'll have that, hey, I'm leaving my house at 8, and I'm calling a vehicle to come and take me to Ames. And I'm going to share that ride with Dave, who's going to come up with me, because we're going in the same 
the direction. So you're going to get more uh, uh, people in that vehicle. Okay. I don't necessarily subscribe to that, actually. <laughs> um, because I think that is, a lot of that has to do with the culture issue. Uh, in uh, maybe in some areas, that's more common. I don't see that yet in the United States. Um, so I'm the opposite. What I'm fascinated with is it's going to be the opposite. We're not, our number's not going to go up. Our number's going to go down. Right? If it's a driverless vehicle, I think we can get below one, which is pretty phenomenal when you think about it, right? Point, point 0.9, point 0.8, that'd be great. But I think that's really possible, right? Because of the amount and the travel, if you're sharing that, we actually won't share it, but there'll be enough mobility, you know, that you can actually, uh, you know, we, we are individualistic a lot of times. I don't view that as a negative, it's a positive. And so I think that that could happen. Now, a lot of people say that that may change generationally. It may. Okay, I don't know. I don't know if that's been decided yet, uh, for sure. But that's a big thing, shared, right? So that's a big conversation that's happening. Whether that happens or not, we'll see. DOT, right? So I put a question mark there, <laughs> right? You know, what is the role of a DOT with mobility as a service, driverless vehicles, and we're talking all kinds of driverless vehicles, right? Seamless mo modal mobility, data choices, right? So I put up a few. These are all essentially driverless uh, uh, types of vehicles that are under design, implementation, development, a whole lot of different frames right now, okay? And uh, anything, right? Commercial, uh, cars, buses, rail, trams, snow plows, can they be driverless? Sure, absolutely. There's even some, I think University of Michigan's been working on some technology related to driverless snow plows. All of that is on the cusp is under uh, uh, research right now, okay? So what does that mean for DOT? I don't know, right? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So what I wanna talk about though is mobility as a service. So what you see there is mobility as a service, it says, enables new market approach. I pulled this slide off the web. Um, this was discussed a lot when I was at um, ITS World Congress. This is the main, it's almost in their theme uh, overall. And so, uh, and you can see what I like about the slide is what's the dollar figure in? It's in euros, right? Right, so what they're doing is purchasing mobility, right? It becomes a package that you buy, right? So it's not, so it's almost in the sense of, you know, not vehicle ownership, you're buying mobility, right? Rather than a vehicle. And so what it says is like, okay, so the urban commuter package is 95 euros a month. They're gonna get, for, for 95 years, they get free public transport in home city area. They get up to 100 kilometers free taxi, up to a 500 kilometers rental car, uh, and domestic public transport up to 1,500 kilometers. Pretty interesting, right? Sort of think about it in the sense of the shift that's happened in our, our phones, right? We used to pay for minutes. <laughs> You don't pay for minutes anymore, you pay for data, right? You're buying the amount of data. You can call as much as you want. It's the data piece that you're actually purchasing, right? And, and it's very similar. So you, they give you different scenarios, right? A business package is 800 euros a month, gives you five minutes pickup in the whole EU, you know, the European Union, free taxi in home city, lease car, road use, taxi roaming worldwide, right? And family package is 1,200 euros a month, lease car, road use, shared taxi for all family with 15 minutes pickup, so within 15 minutes somebody will pick you up. Home city public transport for all, domestic public transport for 25 kilometers, 2,500 kilometers from your home. Mobility as a service. Pretty interesting, huh? So how, how, does that have a net effect on us? What we do, how we do it? I think so, right? Does this work in Wyoming? Why not? What? What if it says, you know, leased horse and road use? Does it work then? Right? I don't know. You know, that's my question. It, it, it may work in some areas, right, more effectively. Uh, and, and I'm not sure. 
how that fits the United States yet, okay? A yeah, portion of it sure does, I think, potentially, right? If you have density, if you're in a, you know, a heavy urban area, you could see people buying mobility as a service, right? But if I live in a, a town of 100 in uh, Wyoming, uh, I'm not sure if that functions, right? I don't know how long it's gonna get me to get that taxi, or if I call Uber, you know, I don't know if I'm gonna get it within 15 minutes. Right? I don't think so. So, you know, there's a balance to that. Um, and that's even long term. So 40 years from now, you know, uh, are they going to have mobility services that you can purchase in Wyoming? I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe it's different. Maybe it's more uh, from a plane perspective because right? the technology changes. Because the last slide I had, let me go back to this. This is an autonomous, uh, essentially, plane that they've been working on. So no pilot. Just jump in. That'd be great. Woo. People worry about jumping into an autonomous car, right? How long is the courtship for an autonomous plane? A little bit longer, right? A little bit, maybe. OK, so what I want to go back to is, so you can see I have a series of sort of circles that jump off that we're going to talk about and have some dialogue about as we go forward. And the first one, after we get past mobility as a service, is there questions or comments about mobility as a service? Don't be shy. I'm going to probe a little bit further and we'll see if we can get some comments out of you guys. So technology, right? What is the role of a state DOT? A lot of people have seen me say this before. Fusion of information is happening around transportation, data, land use, telecommunications, vehicles, commerce, tons of things, right, are happening, sort of fusing around. The other thing that I put up here is a fusion of interest by businesses across transportation, which are non-traditional transportation businesses. So what I, I thought I'd do is, is read. One of the things that happens when you, I got the opportunity to become national president is, because of all of you, by the way, is I get to speak to the rest of the states. And, and I wrote this uh, a couple of weeks ago. Some of this you've, you may have uh, heard or portions of, but I wanted to read and sort of talk about this, this, this issue. The center of the web of influence of transportation is freedom of choice, economic aspirations, quality of life, and connecting people face to face. Today's connected world has not diminished our need for in-person interaction. It has actually done the opposite created an increased demand for movement of a single product or person from one point to another from everywhere on the planet. Our business of transportation is accelerating. The diversity, the information, the data, the means of services, the medium of our products and the requirements of us. That is what makes what we do so demanding, so interesting, and one of my personal things, is so truly meaningful. I think that's one of the biggest effects that it has. There are many disruptive activities happening within and around transportation, which I believe to be positive for our future. There are more businesses focusing on products that will have a direct impact on us, but even more focused on our customers and businesses using the transportation system than there have been in the history of our industry. I see this fusion of interest as raising the bar of expectations in changing the outcome for the better of all. So, typically we have a lot of businesses that want to work with us, right? They want to do our work, right? They want to help us build things, help us manage things, help us operate things. What's happening now is we're getting a lot of non-traditional companies focusing on what? Our customers? Yes, right? Uber is an example, right? Uh, our vehicles, the technology in vehicles, technology companies, all sorts of companies. Are, there are more companies interested in transportation than there ever has been before. And I think that is a very interesting time. That means, one, I actually believe that that point of no return is, is, is here. It's arrived, okay? But because of that interest, um, and that sort of gets to some, these last couple points on the slide. High quality machine ready data, 
data quality, data integration, enterprise architecture. Those are the things that I think are very important as we think about the future of transportation, right? And um, do we do that today? A little bit, right? A little bit. Does this change? Is this what a typical role of a state DOT is? Probably not, right? We typically focus on things, right? Bridges, railings, concrete, asphalt. You know, those are the things we typically focus on. Right? That's a shift. I believe this is a shift because this enables that future. I don't know what the future is. I can't tell you for sure. There's a lot of ideas. Mobility is a service. The more we focus on this, and part of the reason I, you guys hear me talk about data all the time, it doesn't matter what task we do. If you draw it back to a specific point, it starts with a piece of data. And if the data is really good and has good quality, likely it makes the task product, the service, good. If it's not, it likely doesn't make it good or has some sort of error potentially in it. Okay? So let's go on. So this next slide is more about us, right? DOT, right? What do we do? Planning, design, construction, operations, maintenance, all those types of things. Motor carrier services, driver's license, regulation, right? Everybody loves that word. That's an enabling word, regulation. Right? So what in here, you see in the middle I have customer in the question mark. What's the customer in the, in the, the dark planning, design, construction, operation? Who's the customer? The public? Okay. Good. Any other thoughts? Is the asphalt the customer? Is the bridge? Is the process, right? right? Under motor carrier services? Hey, this is the process. You gotta go through this process if you're gonna get that. It's the way it is process sometimes can become the customer. The regulation can become the customer, right? And so conceptually, and this is something that, that I like to say, is that people and products, right? Product movement is what I'm talking about, by the way. Not the products that we produce, product movement, are customers. We often, and a lot of times on the top half, planning, design, construction, operations, the main customer is, the vehicle. We talk about the vehicle, whatever the vehicle is. Is it a car? Is it an SUV? Is it a commercial truck? How much does it weigh? What are its axle spacings? You know, that's the focus of what we're doing, right? And as we think about the future of transportation, my belief is our role is to actually understand that inside every vehicle is a person or a product. The more we talk about the person and the product from a transportation perspective, the more we're actually hitting the main customer entity, okay? And we often talk about the vehicle. We all, that's what we spend most of our time on, right? And so, what's our vision? Can't hear you. Smarter, simpler, customer-driven. Customer-driven, right? Customer. So let's go back. Mobility as a service. Who's the customer? See it, right? It's a person, right? Business, right? It's a person. Very clearly, it connects to the person. A lot of times, we don't do that as much today. I'm not trying to say we don't do. You, I think we've started to make the shift uh, towards customer their expectations on the system, what they see, their perceptions of the system, even though their perceptions may be different from what our data says. We have to embrace that, right? Okay? That, you can see that shift, right? And I think the more that we are, and I think this is one of the, you know, I think a very position that we're in uh, from an advantage is we've already started to talk about customer specific, okay? And it's in our vision, it's in really getting you there safely, conveniently, and efficiently, right? You, we're not saying getting the car there, you know, 
safely efficient, we're talking about you as a person, right? That, I think, is an important shift for us as we think about the future, wherever that future takes us to. Okay, so um, regulation. So right now, the uh, National Traffic Highway Safety Administration, NHTSA, is working on rules um, to require, they're going to likely require uh, all vehicles to have some uh, uh, connected components within the vehicle, meaning so that they can connect to a traffic signal or another vehicle, right? They're, they're actually writing these right now. So the question, and I actually posed this when I was in uh, at, the, at the meeting in Bordeaux, was what's going to come first? Google's working on a driverless vehicle. Apple is actually working on a vehicle too. There's probably going to be one coming out. Is the Google and the Apple car going to come out before the regulation, or is the regulation going to come out before the car? The car, absolutely. What takes longer? Regulations, right? Because they have to put it out, they have to get comments, and they're talking, they're, they're going to try to come out with it by 2019. Google's time frame is like 2017, okay? And so that is sort of an interesting uh, framework, right, overall, right? We tend, is regulation an enabler or an inhibitor? It, it can be both, I actually advocate. Typically, it's an inhibitor, right? And, and do we want to be an inhibitor or an enabler? I believe we do it really well. We're an enabler. Okay? Not all organizations are set up to that, that way. That's something for us to, to understand overall. I want to go back a slide, too. Let me go back. So that top uh, piece up there, the, the drone or the UAV, or, there's all kinds of words for it. Right? I saw that in Bordeaux. They are actually testing that. It moves um, basically medical samples, organs. Uh, from one hospital to another. And uh, they actually had, I took a live picture of it, and they, it has a little box, and boom, it'll just move like a, maybe there's a transplant that they have to do. It'll shift it and move it from one hospital to another, just like that. No traffic, no congestion, life safety, all those types of things. Pretty fascinating. So, is there regulation on those? It's coming, it's coming right? Yeah. FAA, so the first regulation was that if you fly one of those, you have to have a commercial pilot's license. Think everybody's getting that? Is the real estate person out there taking pictures of you a commercial pilot? No, not at all. My son built a quadcopter, carbon fiber drone, has a, when he was 16, bought all the parts, built it himself, uh, as a remote. I got to drive it once and I flew it into a tree. He won't let me ever fly it anymore. <laughs> he set the remote up for a left-handed person, so that's my excuse. He's left-handed, I'm right, so of course it was wrong. But he, he's not a pilot, just so you know. <laughs> okay. He's actually a student here now. But it's uh, uh, pretty fascinating to think about. And now they've said, because the rule just came out, is that if your Tim was doing this for me this morning. So if you have one of these, you just, you don't have to have a pilot's license anymore if it's non-commercial, right? Uh, but they all have to uh, uh, be um, essentially licensed, right? You, you're gonna have to have some sort of uh, sticker on it. So what's a drone, right? Is it a lot of balloons, right, with a camera? Technically, they say under the rule, the answer is yes, right? So if you have a big birthday party and a lot of balloons, and you better get licensed from the FAA to float all those healing balloons. Right? You can see how it can become an inhibitor. Right? As I like to say, the FAA has a better chance of regulating ants right now okay, than these. These are they're just happening. Right? The technology is going everywhere. It has huge uh, opportunity for us right, to uh, uh, think about doing structure inspection changing the cameras, getting, uh, uh, you can get uh, all kinds of different views uh, with, with the camera, uh, with the drone. You don't have to shut down necessarily traffic, right, as we typically do now. 
So they have profound opportunity. Agriculture industry is using them all over the place. Um, if they think they're going to try to regulate it now, it's going to be very, very challenging, and it only becomes an inhibitor, which is not good.